Hi everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Margaret Ellis Raymond and I'm an author and I was born with tricuspid atresia. This series of videos is to thank all mothers of CHD children. The human side of congenital heart conditions is often buried by the medical. I hope this series of videos brings comfort and answers. If you enjoy, please subscribe as that helps me reach more people who might benefit from this content. Happy Mother's Day. Hello. I can't hear you yet. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted on my side. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, this is awesome that you're doing this. So. Yeah, I, I feel like it needs to happen. <laughs> now, are you a CHD mom or are you a CHD patient? Patient. First off, can you tell me a little bit about um, your, your son? My name's Monica Sanford. Uh, my son is David Michael Sanford, and he was born with a congenital heart defect. He is uh, going to be 29 May 16th, so coming up soon. And uh, he was born with double outlet right ventricle. So basically his aorta and his pulmonary artery both coming off his right ventricle. And now he is a single ventricle on tan. Oh, okay. Huh. All right. Uh, I, there's, there's so many different conditions that I'm learning yeah, about. Yeah, right by doing this, these interviews. Okay. Um, and even if he has a, a DORV, a double outlet right ventricle, and then you will have even so many different kinds of DORV patients. Right, right. Just like I have tricuspid atresia, but someone else who has my same condition presents completely differently or has extra defects right. along with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you found out that he had this defect. Where were you in your, were you a nurse at that point? I wasn't, I was uh, getting my, I had just got my business degree or working on my business degree, but I was seven months pregnant. Mm -hmm. He was my first child. I went to a, uh, just a regular appointment and they said something's wrong. So mm -hmm. the uh, perinatologist came in, the pediatric cardiologist came in the room uh, everybody came to look at the echo and they told us there was an issue with his heart mm -hmm. at the time. I had no idea what that meant. So shocking is not the right word because you don't even knew, know what that means yet. Right. Um, so it was uh, definitely, you know, kind of stops you in your tracks and makes you think about, uh, is the baby safe? Let me let the baby grow. Let me do what they tell me to do. They put me on bed rest. And so everything they tell you to do from that point on, it was uh, monthly checkups and or weekly checkups and and daily checkups and so right. You just want to know what's best for the baby, of course. And is that how? Because you're a nurse right now, right? I'm a nurse practitioner in cardiology. Okay, and so was your son's condition prompting you to go into that field? Uh, One hundred percent. When he was in the. Uh, the pediatric ICU, we had taken him home for a couple of weeks and he was went in for his first heart cath and that sent him into heart failure and he had to go into the PICU, the pediatric ICU. And that was when just kind of all the light bulbs started going on and going off type thing. It was, uh, I was watching all the nurses, all the doctors, everybody that would lay hands on him. You just uh, take it all in. And you, I just was kind of hyper aware of, you know, everything they were giving him, all the medications they were giving him, the, tr the treatments, and, you know, what does that tube do, and what does this do? It was the nurses at his bedside that uh, made me want to go into nursing, and that was 30 years ago, so. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, so I was a bedside nurse for uh, about 15 years, and now I'm a nurse practitioner and see cardiology patients. Awesome. That must be so rewarding. I love it. Awesome. What was your initial reaction to finding out your son has a, a heart defect? Was very, um, you kind of go into a mother bear mode and you're just like, anything I can do to help it to be better. Mm -hmm. And if I can control anything, then that's what I'm going to control. So anything, his surgeon, we were extremely blessed with his surgeon, uh, Dr. Frank Midgley up at DC Children's. He had almost every single, um, you know, surgery planned for him so far out in the future. 
it gave me a ton of time to do a ton of research on uh, what that actually meant. So when he was going to have his, uh, the only one that I didn't really have time for was his first one, um, just because it was kind of emergent. But uh, other than that, then the central shunt, then his Blaylock Thomas Talisic shunt, uh, his Glenn shunt, and then the fenestrated Fontan. It just gave me so, you know, between each surgery, so much time to look into what exactly the anatomy and physiology was of each procedure and kind of expectations coming out. Yeah. So when, when you go in with certain expectations, uh, good or bad, they're always probably gonna change at some point. So I just kind of wanted to learn everything I could about it. So at least I knew some of what was going on. Right. So as a nurse practitioner, how do you, I, I know some parents are, are like that where they want to know and research and have all the information and then there are others who don't they're like i don't want it's right. like too scary um which i get to which i which i can see but yeah do you see both you see both sides of it when patients come in oh 100 and i try to give them as much information as they're comfortable with or at least now see 30 years ago when my son was born we didn't have social media and we didn't have all that networking and all the community boards on social sites and things like that. We just, we didn't have it. And um, now there are so many resources out there at a click of a button. So even if the family is not ready to hear anything today, they will eventually. But my job is to make sure they know where to go to get that information when they're ready. So I can tell them, and there are some of it they won't remember but at least if I hand them something that has mended little hearts group on it or a pediatric congenital heart association, adult congenital heart association, because then in the future, those, those kids, you know, living into adulthood now is the norm, uh, is not the exception. So all these kids being born now are going to thrive into adulthood if they are taken care of properly at certified centers. So that's my big push is just lifelong care at congenital centers awesome. that, that are certified congenital centers, not just, you know, somebody that kind of, kind of understands it. No, <laughs> I, I want all these kids, <clears throat> excuse me. I want all these kids to go to a certified congenital center where that's all these cardiologists do all day, every day is congenital heart disease. Right, very specific. And I know a lot of the organizations that you mentioned, they have like search and make sure that your cardiologist is part of their organization or um, is licensed or, or along those lines. So yeah. Right. And I just literally today just got an email. I just uh, was appointed on the well, first, I'm on the uh, Florida Pediatric Congenital Heart Technical Advisory Panel for the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. But today, I was just appointed to the American, American College of Cardiology uh, Advocacy Committee for the state of Florida. So my big advocacy, of course, is congenital heart disease and lifelong care. So uh, oh, those, uh, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> advocacy. Thank you. So everything I do is advocating for that. Awesome. How, how did you cope with finding out he had a diagnosis? What gave me peace is just knowledge and that I, if the nurses or the doctors or somebody was telling me something, it gave me peace to understand it. So my coping was just reading everything I could. Back then it was available, which now is just so much more available, uh, overwhelming sometimes. But, um, but back then it was, you know, massaging my son's foot when he couldn't move and because he was in the ICU, he was just coming out of surgery. So just being near him, singing to him, massaging his feet, massaging his head, I could physically see the monitors, his heart rate would improve, his breathing would improve. So just that, me, that physical touch and mm -hmm. reading, 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 that, that was, yeah. Anything somebody would give me to learn about his heart problem is, you know, kind of what, uh, what mentally calmed me down. <laughs> now, 
Now that's interesting that you mentioned about massaging the feet. Is that something that most people in your um, group would recommend to parents who come in? I would definitely check with your cardiologist, depending on the vascular and the blood flow and the circulation, things like that. But I am a huge believer in massage of feet and head and hands. And even with my adult patients, I tell uh, that have just gone through other heart surgeries or things that are not congenital. Uh, it's just relaxing. It helps their circulation. I can tell their blood flow improves. Is you know, to me, it's very healing. Awesome. Now you mentioned congenital. So congenital is present at birth, correct? That's yes. what that means. So it's not genetic. There could be genetic portions of it. My son had genetic testing uh, when he was first born, and they there are syndromes based on uh, or congenital heart disease based on different genetic syndromes. Uh, my son didn't fall in the category of having a specific syndrome or genetic basis, but there are some definitely that um, are genetic based. And I know there's a very high percentage of uh, Down syndrome babies mm -hmm. that have uh, genetic markers for heart disease. So it can be some parts genetic, and I know probably some of your viewers, they will tell you the exact genetic code and marker that their child had that was associated with their heart disease. Okay, yeah, because when I, I did research, that makes sense, because when I did research, I was like, okay, my condition is congenital, and my parents kept telling me, well, it's not genetic, and I was yeah. like, but when I go to the groups, I'm seeing people talk about genetics, and I'm like, there's, a, so that just cleared that question up for me, that makes a lot of sense, and I, some can be, that. and some, yeah. some will not be. What was pregnancy like? Did was it different because he had a heart condition or, or did you not have um, a child before him so you couldn't quite see yeah, the difference? He was, yeah, he was my first. So everything was, you know, fine until, and I was walking every day, working out every day, I was staying healthy. Um, and seven months pregnant, I mean, I was still, I was so small 30 years ago now, not so much, but, um, <clears throat> excuse me. 30 years ago, I would walk and work out every day. And then at seven months pregnant, they found out, um, the first thing they told us was the baby's not growing. And then they wanted to know why the baby's not growing. So the baby's not growing, they put me on bed rest. So from seven months to the end of my pregnancy, um, when they induced labor and um, took the baby, took my baby, it was, uh, I, they put me on bed rest and gave me, <clears throat> two pages of food to eat. They would say, help the baby grow, you know, eat as much as you can and we're trying to give him nutrition. And then they found out about his heart problem. And so they were saying, we need him really pumped up uh, for his first heart surgery type thing. So I was on bed rest for a good two months or so and eating everything in sight because that's what they wanted me to do. So, so I, you know, when they first found out at seven months, he was about uh, two pounds and he was born four pounds. <laughs> wow. wow. I gained a bunch of weight and he gained two pounds. <laughs> so is that considered premature no, or not, not? No, no, no. Cause he was born at the normal nine. He months, was, right? he was, he was born full term. Okay. So he was born full term. They, at that time and now it's, cons I don't do OBGYN, but now it's a, uh, it's called inner uterine growth retardation where just the growth is re re retarded, meaning uh, slowed down. So the intrauterine, while I was pregnant, the growth was slowed. And was it because of his heart? They couldn't tell me for sure. Was it, you know, but then, you know, fast forward five years later, and I had my daughter, she's completely healthy, and she was only four pounds. So I just made small babies, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. Could you describe to me what delivery was like? They planned to induce me so everybody could be available in the room. So when they said, it's time, we need to take the baby, and they induced me, and they had the perinatologist there, the, all the OB, GYN specialists, the pediatric specialist, pediatric cardiologist. It was a room full because nobody quite knew what to expect with this severe uh, congenital heart defect that they had seen. And... So it was, it was a packed room, packed house. And when they 
when he first was born, delivered, he uh, cried and they checked him out and he was, um, his pulse ox were fine and he was little, little bluish tint, but we had him, we had him home for about two weeks before we had to take it back in. Oh, okay. So it wasn't like he was born and then immediately a surgery. It was. Yeah, he uh, was, we had him uh, in the hospital just for a few days, probably two days longer than the normal birth. And he was stable. He was, uh, went from four pounds to five pounds in about five days. So they said we could take him home and took him home. And um, about two and a half weeks later, we had a cath scheduled in the heart cath. Um, was just too much for him. So he went from the heart cath straight over to DC Children's Hospital. So, uh, and that's where he had all his surgeries. Okay. And how many surgeries was it for? He had, he had four uh, major surgeries and then one was the, uh, the amplatzer was closed with, or the, I'm sorry, the fenestration in the Fontan was closed with an amplatzer device. So that was done in the cath lab. But, um, the, of course, with a Fontan, single ventricle Fontan, even a cath is a major procedure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, if you go through heart caths, you <laughs> nothing's super easy and cut and dry. And, yeah, it's, it's all complicated. What was the process like to bring him to the hospital and you knew that the surgery was going to happen? What was that like for you? It was... Um, well, we were in the, we were a Marine Corps family. My husband was in the Marine Corps. So we were in Hawaii and we would travel back from Hawaii to DC Children's uh, for all his surgeries. So, cause we were comfortable at DC Children's. We loved his surgeon. The surgeon was amazing. Uh, so it was worth the travel, but we knew in Hawaii, we had a pediatric cardiologist that would uh, keep track of his growth and keep track of his, uh, you know, his vital signs, things like that, uh, different things that tell you, okay, he's doing great, but it's time for his next stage procedure. And uh, so it was about, you know, four or five days traveling, getting him comfortable in a hotel room type thing, getting him, and then going into the, uh, the day of the surgery, you're handing over your child, and it's just, they might as well just take your heart with it. Right, right. That's probably the, the trickiest and, and most difficult part of it. And that you're not giving your child away just once. It's like a couple of months later, you have to do it all over again. So we were very lucky. It was about a year between each one. So we would get him home and he would get back into routine. And then when he was getting older, we would get him in school, you know, things like that. But then it was, you know, about a year, year and a half back to uh, for the next procedure. But, there was, there was one time that was about five years between a procedure that he was okay. doing so well. And, yeah. uh, and then it was time for the uh, Amplatzer. Okay. Replace, so. so with this condition today, do they have different protocols for the timing of the surgeries? You know, I, there have been, that I have seen, there have been multiple attempts at different stage procedures. And the ones that I have seen, they always come back to the ones my son had. Okay. So we, my son, like I said, extremely fortunate. We were so blessed to have the surgeon we had and had the stage procedure that he had um, and all the, however, like we were saying before, all these kids are different and they may have, you know, the Norwood, they may have other procedures done that they're doing great with or take a univentricle, one ventricle, and make it into you know, two ventricles. Uh, we, my surgeon didn't opt for that for my son, and now it's worked out the best for him. So who, who knows if he would have had a different procedure, if it would have had a different outcome or whatever, but I know there are different procedures now for a double outlet right ventricle, um, yeah, but they still use my son's, my son's stage procedure as well. Great. I'm glad you were fortunate to have. That must be reassuring now to know, okay, they did they did the right yeah. surgeries, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. The right time. <laughs> yeah, Thirty years later, they're still 
use and they still come back to those procedures that he had 30 years ago. So we were very lucky. We were lucky that our surgeon, Dr. Midgley, knew at that time you know, how to treat it. Yeah. And the stage procedures back then, they're still being practiced today. So, What are some recommendations that you give to moms um, for kind of handling that prep time before the surgery? Do you have any advice? Well, just in general, um, once you have a child with congenital heart disease, you it becomes the family's entire focus. And it takes a village to raise that one baby, but don't neglect your other children. Let them make decisions in vacations and let them make decisions of you know, anything you want to do as a family, that it, it can't just always be about the congenital heart disease baby. Right. Yeah, uh, the whole family has to be involved. So, um, but moms just, you know, it's different for every mom, of course, because it's their baby. The, the main thing I would say is when this child goes through all the different stages, they're going to limit themselves they are going to physically, but the main thing is don't limit your heart baby mentally or intellectually. You know, the things I can control, I try to keep them away from sick people. I try to keep them away from smokers or, you know, things like that, that you, know, you, you do what you can as a mom, but sometimes you just can't control stuff and that's okay. <laughs> you know, they're they're going to do it themselves. What? general advice would you give a mom who is expecting a CHD um, child? To look around your area to make sure you are at a certified congenital heart center. Uh, that is the biggest takeaway is uh, if, if your facility doesn't tell you about them, go out and start, start seeking it on your own. Um, most times now they're they will be told. But I've still run into patients now that they are being followed by general cardiology or general practitioners, their primary care physicians, things like that, and have never been told that there is a certified congenital heart center. So uh, just if, if you're expecting, you will want to be at a certified center that, that not only does heart cast, but that can have the CV surgeons on backup if you need, the specialists in, in congenital heart disease that you need all under one roof. So, and they're out there, they exist, and maybe a little dry for some people, but it's worth it. Once you, once you find out the baby has a heart problem, that should be the, you know, the wheels start turning for you to go get uh, involved in different communities, different groups, look at the Pediatric uh, Congenital Heart Association website, and they have all the resources in one place that you could, that will lead you in the right direction from wherever you live. Usually, uh, on a McDonald House or the PICU, the NICU, and the different ICUs and different hospitals around this area, if they have a baby born with a heart uh, condition, they will call me or uh, somebody else with the Mended Little Hearts group, and we will go give them a ton of resources and a little bravery bag. We will welcome them to the Heart Baby family. You know, it's uh, I only do adults as far as in clinic and see patients, uh, adult cardiology patients. But those babies, um, when they're born, they will call us. We will go give them resources. Uh, that that's my biggest push. Men and Little Hearts Group, Pediatric Congenital Heart Association, and the Adult Congenital Heart Association. Awesome. Great. Yes. And well, anything on social media, your show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they can definitely, I'm sure, go to your show and get links to ever, anything that they would need now. That This is amazing that this is available now because, like I said, 30 years ago, we didn't have this. So Right. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you. And, and sharing your story. And um, I know that a lot of moms out there will be so thankful to have this to watch. Thank you so much. Yeah, if anybody you know, has any questions, they're welcome to free to reach out to me. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye.